double mon von today and some cracks in Tade Pagacha's seemingly impenetrable armor. What do you see when you look at this profile? That's right, you don't see the flat and rolling hills in the first 80 kilometers, but that section of this race defines who gets in the break and how cooked the climbers will be when they get to Mont Blanc 2 twice. And of course, a lot of riders were interested in the breakaway, particularly Alaphilippe and Quintana, who were going for King of the Mountain points. But the first climbs are Category 1. I feel like Quintana invested a lot to go with Julian Alaphilippe and contest a Cat 4 sprint, which gives you one point when there's 40 points available on top of Mont Blanc 2. Alaphilippe eventually drops dropped him, takes the solitary point on offer for that category one climb, continues solo whilst Wal Van Aert and Conrad are chasing behind. And then the climbers are trying to get in the break, like Simon Yates, still out of Philippe on his own at the start of this 200 kilometer stage, and he sees the break coming. So maybe the plan originally was to go in the early break to protect that intermediate sprint for Mark Cavendish, who was obviously under OTL pressure today. Alaphilippe attacks again with Dan Martin, but they're brought back by Perez and Nielsen Powers in that group before Tony Martin crashed again and abandoned the Tour de France. He's crashed like four times. Feel so sorry for him, but his teammate Wal van Aert was in a strong break chasing Alaphilippe with Greg van Avermaet and three Trek riders who are working pretty hard, Elisande Mollema and Julien Bernard, chasing the four up front of Dan Martin, Alaphilippe Perez, and Pierre Rolland. But Ineos, before the first descent of Mont Ventoux, started pacing on the flat with Luke Rowe. It was a warm day presumably for Richard Carapaz, but they were pacing on the flat, which wasn't really putting anyone under pressure. Dan Martin takes the 10 points for the first category one. And still that quartet was up the road with Julian Bernard and Wal van Aert chasing them. They eventually sit up and they all come together. This was our break, notable riders being Alaphilippe, Wal van Aert and Balka Mollema. And yeah, Ineos also pacing. Grant Thomas did a huge pull today, like 30 kilometers before the first ascent of Mont Ventoux. 2. And yeah, they were five minutes behind the break at this point, maybe more than five minutes. This is before the first ascent of Mont Ventoux, 2, which the break is about to get to, the Basque fans waiting for them. Julien Alaphilippe promptly attacks again, despite the hard start he'd had. And I thought, is he really going for the stage win? Or is he kind of doing what he did last year on Col de la Lose, where he's just sort of trolling in the break? I remember with Richard Carapaz, he got really mad at him. But he did drop Dan Martin, who'd contested that Cat 1 sprint. Whilst Ineos were pacing with Dylan Van Baal, I think Thomas and Luke Rowe had dropped at this point. And not too many big names being put under pressure, apart from David Godou for FDJ, who appeared unwell. FDJ having an absolute shocker at this year's Tour de France. But Alaphilippe, he went for the KOM points on the first ascent of Mont Ventoux, which is a cat one, so only 10 points on offer. But all these accelerations would surely catch up for Alaphilippe. Maybe they were for the cameras. The descent is super fast off Mont Ventoux. They're hitting 100 k's an hour. But Julian Bonard did a magnificent job for Trek Segafredo pulling, keeping the gap at five minutes despite Ineos chasing for his teammates Elisande and Bernard. They get to the second ascent of Mont Ventoux. He pulls off Kwiatkowski style and Kenny Elisande attacks. And you think, why isn't he pulling for Barcamolo? Well, Mollema's not the favourite in this group. He's probably the third favourite behind Alaphilippe and Wild Van Aert. They're not worried about Durbridge and uh, Murasa for bike exchange in Alpecin, but they want Alaphilippe or Wild Van Aert to pull so that Mollema can get a free ride. They tried something similar on the first ascent, and it put Pierre Rolland under a lot of pressure. So it's not a bad plan for Trek Segafredo. The problem is Wild Van Aert attacks and bridges across. Mollema loses his wheel, and now that whole plan falls down because Wild Van Aert's looking good. Kenny Elisander might not even be able to hold his wheel, and even if he does, Wild Van Aert's beating him in a sprint at the end. And so Mollema's going to have to attack. Alaphilippe couldn't help him and completely cracks, and Mollema's basically having to do a full gas effort back to the situation his teammate created at the same time as Wout Van Aert attacking Kenny Elisande, going clear, setting his own pace, the big man on Mont Ventoux. Whilst Ineos get to the base of Mont Ventoux, five minutes behind Wout Van Aert, they're pacing with Tao Gagan Hart, then they bring in Castroviejo afterwards. They're obviously trying to set something up for Richard Carapaz. They whittle the group down to about 10 riders pretty quickly. Richie Port pulling, doing a pretty good job after his second crash of the tour, I think, yesterday. And here's the GC contenders. You can see all bunched together. You've got Carapaz. Pegata does have one teammate in Rafael Maika, then Kelderman, Maas, Lutschenko, Rigoberto Uran, and Jonas Vingegaard. No Sepp Kuss to help Jonas Vingegaard on today's stage, despite the parkour seemingly suiting him and it being warm conditions. It certainly hurt Ben O'Connor, who lost three places on GC today, dropping early on the second ascent of Vaughn 2. And eventually Kenny waits for Barker Mollema, but they're a minute behind Wout van Aert at this point, and him being able to descend like a god on the other side, it already looked like a wrapped up stage win for Wout van Aert and Jumbo Visma. But Kvyatkovsky had his best performance of the tour so far. He pulled so well on Vaughn 2 after Shelley Renard until he pulls off 
and Richard Carapaz looks around. And this is telltale sign number one that Richard Carapaz was not feeling nearly good enough to attack. He's had his team working all day, not just on the climbs, on the flats as well. And when his man finishes his pull with the finish of the climb just in the distance with about 1500 meters to go, he's not gonna try anything. No one else is looking like taking it up and it was Jonas Lingagol in the white jersey, nearly collecting this absolute clown. I'll pause it because I just want you to rant about it. We just saw on stage one, why turning your back to the race is not a good idea. I don't understand it. You go, you cycle up the top of Mont Ventoux, you're waiting there all day in the heat, and you're gonna turn your back to it to try and get some attention on camera like an absolute goon. So luckily, Jonas doesn't collect that man, and Tade Pogacar looks like he's struggling to get to Vingegaard's wheel. Carapaz loses Tade Pogacar's wheel, and the next thing we know, the young Dane has Tade Pogacar putting on his Jebel Hafeet face on the wheel of Adam Yates. Carapaz is trying to bridge back to them with Rigoberto Uran with not much effect. And then Wingergaard drops Pagacha off the wheel. Now listen, he's got a five minute lead. It doesn't really matter. He could have let the wheel go intentionally anyway, but it didn't look like that. It looked like he went over his limit. And Jonas, the quickest time ever from Chalet Renard to the top of Mont Ventoux. Juan Van Aert crested with like a 90 second lead on him and Wingergaard was absolutely flying. The only problem for him was Pagacha 38 seconds behind and Uran a little bit further. They had this long descent to catch back up. Juan Van Aert was clear, stage win guaranteed unless he crashed until the delusional lunatic part of me saw the graphics down below and I was like, should Jumbo Visma get Juan Van Aert to wait up for Jonas Wingergaard? Luckily, Jumbo Visma didn't decide to risk a historical moment for their team for a pipe dream. And so Wingergaard had to do the descent on his own whilst Pagacha, Carapaz and Uran were pulling turns and they were eating into his gap very quickly. Jonas is like a 58, 60 kilo guy. And this is a super fast descent where being heavy or being in a group helps a lot. So Juan Van Aert, stage win locked in the Belgian national champs jersey, distancing Alessandre, Alaphilippe and Mollema on the final ascent of Mont Ventoux. Huge win for him, but a shame for Jonas behind with Tade Pogaccia, Uran and Carapaz catching him in the last K and him gaining no time. Those four coming across the line together with Cavendish safe inside the time limit, green jersey ambitions still firmly alive, but Lucro unfortunately finishing outside the time limit. But just touching back on what I said about Julian Alaphilippe attacking early, Here's what Wal Van Aert had to say about how the start of the stage played out. But I also saw they, they suffered a lot and it was a really big battle to come there. And I think especially Alaphilippe lost a, a lot of power already in that part of the race. I'd be asking as well is did Picacha let the wheel go of Wingergaard or did he go over his limit and he couldn't follow him anyway? Here's what he had to say. It was a hard pace all the climb and in the end uh, Wingergaard attack. Uh, I couldn't follow all the way up. Just a little bit too much and uh, yeah, I exploded a little bit. but. Uh, managed to, to, save, uh, yes, to save it in the end with uh, Richard Carapaz and uh, Uran. Here's the final results. Wal Van Aert winning ahead of Elisonda and Mollema, a trek 1-2. I hope you enjoyed the video. Like it down below if you did. We've got a sprint stage tomorrow. But let me know down below, do you think Cav is equaling Merck's record tomorrow? But until then, ciao.